American literature. What exactly is American about it? Well, American stories aren't written for their plot, but instead to criticize something about the real world, or even the United States. While not all American stories exemplify this, most of the classics do. Classics such as F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, and Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. The first example is in The Great Gatsby, often referred to as the greatest American novel of all time. While the plot of the story is what drives the story forward, it's not the point of the novel. For those who haven't watched or read The Great Gatsby, you probably should. It's definitely worth the time. But in any case, I'll summarize the plot. It's basically about a protagonist, Nick, who observes a love story filled with cheating, drama, and death. But first, we learn about Nick, and then Tom and Daisy, a married couple. Shortly after, we're introduced to Myrtle, who's this guy's mistress. But the thing is, Myrtle's already married to somebody else, Wilson. At the same time, we're also introduced to a few other important symbols. The Valley of Ashes, and the giant glasses of T.J. Eckelberg. But, what does it all mean? Well, it all comes down to one word. Symbolism. We'll get to those symbols and symbolism later. But first, we're introduced to Gatsby. Gatsby, when introduced, is extremely wealthy and constantly holds house parties. Shortly after Nick attends one of these parties, we learn about Gatsby's past from Jordan, who was introduced in the beginning of the book and is a friend of Tom and Daisy, but is also a friend of Gatsby. Daisy tells her, who tells Nick, about Gatsby's past. So at this point, we have the entire love story. We have Daisy, who's married to Tom, but Gatsby also loves Daisy, and Tom also loves Myrtle, but Myrtle is married to Wilson. And then we have Nick and Jordan, who are just watching this giant love story unfold. For now, we're only going to focus on Daisy and Gatsby. Originally, the love was mutual. Both Daisy and Gatsby loved each other. But the thing is, Gatsby at the time had no money. He was going into the army and off to war. And despite the fact that Gatsby and Daisy were exchanging letters while Gatsby was fighting the war, Daisy still ended up marrying Tom. Tom was extremely wealthy, unlike Gatsby. So when Gatsby came back, he made himself a fortune to win back Daisy. But, even after Gatsby came back and made his fortune, Daisy still loved Tom. Now this is where the symbolism kicks in. This entire plot is to facilitate the entire idea of new and old money, or inherited versus gained wealth. Fitzgerald also uses East and West to symbolize these two very different concepts. The West symbolizes new, and the East is old. Myrtle also mentioned to Tom that she and Wilson were planning to move west. There's even East and West Egg, the fictional place where most of the story takes place. These two eggs aren't just places, they also stand for something much greater. Because East Egg is filled with people who inherited their money and West Egg is filled with people who made their own money, it shows a clear separation between the two classes. East and West Egg are divided by water, and that water symbolizes the lack of class mobility. Even if someone makes a lot of money, like Gatsby, they're relegated to West Egg, not East Egg. Gatsby never crosses the water to visit Daisy. This turns the water into a metaphor for a divider between the two classes. The entire idea of the two eggs is to show the lack of social mobility in America. In the story, there's also a green light on Daisy's dock. Gatsby always looks at this light, and to him, it represents something more than just Daisy. It was also his future and his dreams. And because the green light is located on East Egg, it shows that Gatsby is always reaching out to that dream, but he never actually gets there. This again shows the lack of social mobility in America because Gatsby, who was poor and became rich, cannot actually fit in with the rich people. He's forced to live in East Egg for the rest of his life. Now we come back to the eyes of T.J. Eckelberg and the Valley of Ashes. The Valley of Ashes is where most of the unsightly actions of the book take place. Because of this, it comes to represent the same unsightly places in American cities. Eyes of T.J. Eckelberg, however, come to represent something very different. They're located at the Valley of Ashes, so they see everything that's happening there. Things such as Tom's affair with Myrtle and Myrtle's death. These are crimes that go unpunished, yet the eyes are always there to provide judgment and to make sure the characters don't forget about what they've done. This applies to the real world, too, where people with money and power aren't diplomatically immune when they commit a crime. The book overall criticizes those that have power and those that inherit their money. It shows the lack of social mobility and how the lower class is forced to stay lower class. 
It gives a metaphor of hopes and dreams with the green light, something everyone searches for. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch our arms out farther, and one fine morning. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Now we have Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which is one big symbol itself. But before we get to that, we need to summarize the most important points of the plot. The story is about the Salem witchcraft trials and starts off after these girls were caught dancing in the woods. Everyone suspects witchcraft, but Reverend Hale from the town over finds no sign of it. Despite having no evidence, Tichuba, one of the slaves, confesses to witchcraft under the threat of being whipped. After Tichuba confesses, Abigail, one of the girls that was caught, also confesses to dealing with the devil. Abigail then begins to accuse others of witchcraft. At this point, the trials that are held begin to resemble those of the McCarthy hearings in the United States. Abigail would accuse someone of witchcraft in the same way that McCarthy would accuse someone of being a communist. There was never any definitive proof. When Abigail accused someone, they either confess to it or they hang. In both cases, that person's life is ruined. When McCarthy accused someone of being a communist, they could either confess to it or prove it later in court. Again, in both cases, that person's political career is also ruined. The book draws a very clear parallel between witchcraft during the Salem Witch Trials and paranoia of communism during the Cold War. It also clearly compared Abigail's accusations with those of McCarthy. Both were unbased and had no proof. Both of the trials ended when someone finally stood up against them. It is rare for people to be asked the question which puts them squarely in front of themselves. Last but not least, there's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. In the book, Huck escapes with a slave named Jim. They ride down the Mississippi River in search of freedom for Jim. And because Jim is a runaway slave, Huck needs to hide him most of the time. The way Jim is treated throughout the story is representative of the time that the story was written. Mark Twain wrote this story after the Emancipation Proclamation, but the story takes place before it. The way Jim is treated in the book is similar to how freed slaves were treated at that time. Twain is trying to show that even though the slaves were freed on paper, they're not being treated any differently. It also shows the dilemma that Huck faces when he wants to help Jim. Huck could have either sent a letter back to Miss Watson saying that he found Jim, or he could help Jim escape to freedom. Huck knew it wasn't the right thing to do, but he did it anyway because he felt that it was right. It's a perfect example of going against conventional wisdom and what was thought to be right at the time. It's freedom and independence of thought, some of the great American virtues.